All right, so um, sorry about that pause. Um, again, I don't have any editing tools, so I can't really clean things up. So um, when I feel like the pauses are gonna be too long or if I just don't know what to talk about, I'm gonna go ahead and stop and then just collect myself and start over. So this segment is gonna be about um, planning. And if, it, if I feel like it's smooth enough, um, I'll try to go ahead and continue on to the flight and landing at the airport. Okay, so what was planning like? So essentially, it's um, a lot of YouTubing um, what quarantine was going to be like, since to me, that was going to be like the biggest hurdle, of course. Um, and, you know, so I did that with um, YouTube and Google. And so the thing is, um, when you guys, you know, um, when you know you want to know something, you just search for it, right? When you don't know what you don't know, you're, you can't search for it. So it's going to bite you in the ass. And that's exactly what happened to me later on. But that's, you know, coming up. So um, essentially, I watched about three to four videos on quarantine. So I knew what to expect, or I thought I did. Um, meaning that um, what happens is when you land in South Korea, um, you're going to be shuttled to um, un uh, a quarantine facility that's what they call it right and so um, when I when I landed and when I finally got to the quarantine facility I asked how many people are in my facility where I'm staying in now they said 300 or approximately and how many quarantine um, facilities there are and they said about five or six so um, that's a lot of people basically that's a lot of preparation um, Yes, this is all paid out of pocket, you know, from the travelers or, you know, if they're business travelers or companies are paying for it or whatever. But still, um, kudos to the South Korean government for actually having something like this in place to keep their citizens safe. Because um, as another um, person on YouTube says, you know, in the United States, nobody seems to care whether or not you live or die um, from the coronavirus. So, um, so basically besides that you don't know where you're gonna go um what else i you know i i heard that um you needed to have a sim card installed in your phone so that um if anything happened to you or whatever they could contact you they meaning like whoever it is the government so i i had to prepare for um my my phone to be unlocked because I've never had a SIM card installed before. So um, I at least got that prepared. So that was good. Um, I also wanted to, again, work from, um, you know, the, the hotel. And I wanted to make sure that um, when I plugged in um, my computer that it wouldn't blow up because then I'd be essentially dead in the water. Um, so I went out and just made sure I got some voltage converters. Um, you know, and I got two of them. Um, turns out I had to get two of them in the last minute because um, the ones that I ordered from Amazon did not arrive in time. So there was a lot of, there was a little bit of last minute scramble there, but it wasn't too bad. Um, I saw from some, like one video that, you know, from a girl from San Francisco, um, like every day she was just getting um, deliveries, like food deliveries of, you know, like coffee, water, rice, you know, standard Korean food and snacks. And her like packages were super big. And then another guy, um, you know, his video, he did not get coffee. He, you know, his food was just, you know, pretty standard. You know, one person really loved the food. Another person really didn't. Um, and I also learned that you can order stuff too, like South, like the, the quarantine facility does allow you to order things that you may need and they'll deliver it to your room, you know, when it arrives. So, um, for me, I thought that that was, you know, perfectly fine. Um, so yeah, I mean, basically, like I said, the planning, um, you know, the deciding and then the planning, like happened in a whirlwind, essentially. I bought my ticket, you know, made it real. Um, and I hadn't really planned for the trip. Like basically, I planned to plan for the trip while I was here. So when I went on the plane, I had no idea what I was gonna be doing in South Korea. I had no idea where to go. I had no idea, you know, whether or not Seoul was on the top or bottom of the map. 
it was kind of crazy. I didn't know too much at all. Um, but anyways, um, so I'm going to stop now to gather my thoughts and start over again. All right. So back to the view just for a little change up. Um, so my biggest fear when I was planning for the trip was that um, something would go wrong with the Chromebook laptop that I was given to work on. So um, obviously that was going to be a carry on. Um, it's just that I don't normally travel with a laptop with me. I, th I think um, I don't remember traveling with a laptop before. Um, and so my biggest fear was that um, it was going to get damaged or I was going to blow it up by plugging it in without a converter, which I thought I took care of. Um, and so that was essentially it. You know, um, I, I thought, you know, I had confidence in myself that I planned for as much as I could and I was just going to deal with shit when, you know, it, it goes wrong. I mean, that's pretty much how, you know, life is. So um, that was it. I got on the plane. I, it was literally like, I think maybe a week and a half when I made the decision to when I got on the plane. And um, the plane was direct. I, I could have saved a couple of hundred bucks by, um, you know, being laid over in Canada, but I didn't want to risk that, you know, coronavirus, right? So I just wanted to go direct. It was a um, 12 or 13 hour flight. It started at midnight and um, it was it was a pretty good flight um, because I just stayed up, you know, started, um, you know, writing in my journal because you know you're just so focused on that and then i got tired it must have been about two in the morning um or basically two hours later after the midnight flight you know after the plane took off um that i went to sleep and because the plane was only at 30 percent capacity i was able to lay down and sleep somewhat pretty well like i mean i think that was the first time i've ever laid down across you know like the whole road to myself um and so when I woke up, there was only like an hour and a half left before we were going to land in Seoul. So um, I took a great night shot of Seoul um, before we landed. And then we landed on, you know, um, at Incheon International Airport. And it was 4 a.m. in the morning. Um, and just to, um, you know, set this up, um, it's 16 hours ahead here to the Bay Area. So basically, um, I told my work that I would be working Bay Area hours. So that means that um, I have to sleep around like 4 or 5 p.m. in Seoul, Korea and wake up at midnight, which is 8 a.m., in the Bay Area and just work from there. So that's what I've been doing. Um, and it actually hasn't been bad. So, um, you know, I'm just kind of waiting to see if anything's going to change. But because I've been on such, you know, a strict schedule, like my body is still is still doing fine. So I'm going to switch the camera back now. So then I land in Incheon and um, it was fine. You know, um, I basically stood in line to go to immigration and um, then I, you know, they, they kind of, you know, spread us apart because people just tend to want to just line up like right behind each other. Right. So they spread us apart, um, which is fine. And then, you know, we went through the gates and then there was another section for foreigners to sit down in front of a, kind of another step in immigration. And I thought that was funny because those guys behind the glass window, um, you know, it just like, it was just like a little wall. You could totally walk around it, but they, you know, I guess it was like a sneeze, like safety thing or whatever. But um, those guys were behind this, the window. They were seated right next to each other. And so me and another foreigner would also be sitting right next to each other, at least for a few minutes while we were ask, answering their questions, right? And, um, so that was weird how like they would spread us apart in the line and then have us sit right next to each other, you know, um, for a bit. And then they asked me, you know, of course, like, why was I here? And I said, I'm a tourist. And then, you know, then they said, you know, do you have any contacts here? And I said, no. And then there they said, well, do you have a Korean phone number? And I said, no. And they said, do you know anyone in South Korea with a Korean number who can be your guardian? And I was just like, no. And then and then they looked at me and said, 
we can't let you pass unless you have a guardian in South Korea. And I was like, okay. So then I basically thought, all right, maybe the hotel can be my guardian. I was also at this point thinking maybe, you know, guardian is, they're saying the English word guardian, but meaning something else. So I was just like thinking, um, well, let's try the hotel, right? So I gave them the hotel number. They called the hotel. The hotel did confirm that I have a reservation there that I hadn't paid for it yet, but that I do have a reservation there. They explain the situation to the hotel person and the hotel person says, no, we're not going to be your guardian. And then um, that was that because that was my only connection to South Korea is that hotel reservation, essentially. And then they said, well, we can't let you out of the airport unless you have a guardian. And I was like, OK, so I actually was a little panicked at that point because I needed to take three, three cleansing breaths, you know, and here's the trick when you get stressed. So I did that three times, three times and felt much better. So um, I said, excuse me, took my phone and I called Greg um, to see if he had any connections to South Korea, at least through his patients. And I explained the situation to him and he kind of freaked out a little bit, but he essentially said no. And, you know, I kind of knew he was going to say no, but I needed to call him first to make sure that, um, you know, that I had to ask and, and let him know what was going on. So we hung up and I didn't know that he was freaked out and he thought I was basically going to have to turn around. And, you know, I was not at that point yet that, you know, turning around was really not an option for me just yet, just because I hadn't tried that hard yet. Yes, I was freaking out, but it wasn't to that point. So then the second call I made was to um, a, a co-worker friend um, who I actually haven't seen in a while and who I don't really know that well. Like we worked together for about a year, um, maybe three or four years ago. Um, we're connected on Facebook and that's pretty much it, right? So I called her <laughs> and she picks up. She's probably going hello. Like she said, hello. And I explained the situation and, um, basically the sound of her voice was telling me like this door was going to be a little close too. And I totally got it because if I got that same phone call, from the same type of like loose connection, I also would have been like, I don't know if I could help you out here, right? Um, you know, and to explain, she um, is Korean. Like I said, our relationship wasn't that to which, you know, I had no idea if she had any close, you know, friends at all in South Korea. I just reached out to her because I knew that she's Korean, period. And that was it. That was the only reason I called. So we hung up. Um, it was a very awkward conversation, as you can imagine. And then I texted. I didn't call because this was an even worse connection. I texted a friend of a friend um, who basically um, I, I told another friend um, that I was doing this. You know, I was very selective with, with you know, who I was telling, you know, that I was uh, taking a trip. She you know, basically introduced me through Facebook um, to a friend of hers who is also a runner who had lived in South Korea for um, nine years. So he was going to know a lot. So I texted this guy again, I, who I've never met, told him the situation and asked if he knew of any solutions. And then that was that he wasn't online. So he wasn't like reading my message right away. So then that was three strikes, right? Kind of. And then I sat down on the airport floor and just sat there and um, took more breaths. And then I thought, OK, I'm going to have to call the embassy, the U.S. embassy. And, um, you know, basically that idea came from um, my my Peace Corps um, background. Like I, I knew that embassies are in every country that, you know, and that, and that they're there to help out the citizens within that country. So we called them, you know, like, you know, my new friends and immigration called them, bec um, because my phone doesn't work, um, in Korea. 
And they're closed because it's Sunday. So I left on a Friday night and Korea is 16 hours ahead. So I land on a Sunday and they're closed. So I briefly thought about having to stay overnight at the airport because, um, you know, because that was the situation. I really had no other alternative. I was, they're not going to let me through. And um, I needed to at least reach to the embassy and see what they could do, but they were close. So I was thinking I was gonna have to stay there overnight. Um, but I also knew that they had an emergency number because, you know, Americans are always getting into trouble, right? Um, but to me, an emergency number is pretty much life or death, right? I mean, I feel like that's how an emergency is defined. And this was not life or death, um, but I decided to call it anyways. And so they called it and they got somebody and I explained the situation in English, thank God. And um, the woman on the other line was also just as confused as I was um, on why this requirement was there. Um, she also thought as I did that they installed SIM cards in the phone to track you. And um, so she completely understood and said that she would get this resolved in 15 minutes. And so we hung up and during that time I got to know, you know, the person who was speaking English to me and really cool guy. Like all of them were super cool. Like they were just doing their jobs. It's like they weren't mean or anything like that. They were like young military guys and military military, not, you know, the civilian military that required two years. But they were actually in it for the long haul and they rotated out every month. And, you know, so I was just asking them questions like, how often does this happen, you know, with situations like mine? And they said, you know, in the month that they were there, you know, because they only had four days left before they rotated out. Um, I think he saw maybe two other occasions and I asked them what that they those people did. And he saw them doing what I was doing, which is like frantically calling um, whoever was available to help bail them out. Um, but none of them called the embassy. So that, so um, he was glad that we found that solution. And hopefully um, they kind of spread the word that this is a solution for anybody else coming in. So it kind of made me think that this is new. The fact that, you know, um, he, he, you, know you know, very few people like knew, you know, that had this problem. Um, and um, that the embassy, I'm sorry, that the embassy didn't know about this. It makes me think that, you know, maybe my research was okay, but who knows? Maybe it wasn't. Um, so um, asked him about, you know, we talked about music, you know, like who he liked. And, and so I learned about a couple of new Korean stars um, that I may listen to. One is Henry. He's this really cool, like pop violinist. Check him out. And what else? So after that, there was just, um, you know, another hoop. So um, they allowed me through once we got the phone call from the embassy, the phone number, the Korean phone number, that was what was required. Um, and that the embassy um, agreed to be my guardian while I'm staying here in Korea. So, so once they got that, they let me through, um, went to another little office. Um, they, you know, made sure that I understand that I was going to be quarantined for two weeks. Um, and that they didn't know where I was going to stay. Nobody knows where you're going to stay. Absolutely nobody knows. Um, you're just basically put on the shuttle and then off you go. And so that's essentially what went on with me. Um, they told me to go downstairs, get my baggage, and then get on the, the, the shuttle. And just just um, sharing this, guys. Um, oh, actually, there was one more step. I'm so sorry. There was one more step. Um, I know this is getting long and probably super boring, but this is, for, you know, for, for me to remember as well. Um, before I went to, you know, that last questionnaire, um, I asked about the SIM card, which I thought would be important anyways. It wasn't required, but, um, you know, I had gotten my phone unlocked and I figured um, installing a SIM card at the airport would be a good idea. So the guy walked, one of the military guys who knew English walked me over there. Um, we uh, spoke to the woman who spoke no English at all, so that's why he walked me over there, which is great. Um, and she was so nice and she was putting the SIM card in and everything. And then, boom, something um, appears on my screen saying you need the unlock password. AT&T, God love you. So, you know, I paid all that money to pay off my phone and they guaranteed that my phone was unlocked and nobody told me that there was gonna be a password required. Um, so that's what happened. So long explanation from the woman, you know, translated to me by the military guy. 
um, that I'm gonna keep my SIM card if I wanted a refund. I can do that in a couple of different places. Um, and here's the instructions and here's a customer service number. So all good, right? I figured I'm gonna call the customer service number from you know the quarantine location and I'll get this all settled. So um, I, you know, so after the, you know the last kind of hurdle, I go downstairs to baggage claim, and um, you know, and you could see like as I was walking around a little bit, you know, getting my SIM card and stuff. That Incheon Airport is super modern, um, and then in the baggage claim, there are like 24 carousels. I don't know how many carousels SFO has, but um, essentially it was a little creepy for me to be walking in baggage claim where nobody else was. There are no tourists. It was just me trying to find my bag in amongst 24 giant carousels. So I definitely got my steps in and I eventually found my bag. Um, and then I eventually got on the, the bus and um, there were um, other people there, thank goodness, because I was like thinking, I can't be the only tourist here right now. So there were other people there. I didn't really know their stories. We weren't like talking to each other or anything. Um, but I took a couple of snaps on the way to the facility. Um, so that was interesting. Um, not very scenic. Um, and then we pulled up to the hotel and I do have pictures of that. And, um, obviously first thing everybody noticed were men and ha people in hazmat. So men and women in hazmat suits, um, essentially, um, processing the bus ahead of us first. And, um, that's when um, a woman in front of me with like a one-year-old baby kind of started crying. And I wasn't expecting that, but um, the gentleman next to her, a Korean gentleman, um, you know, asked her what was going on. So of course everybody could hear like her story, which was, you know, she's Russian. You could tell by the Russian accent. Um, she actually lives in South um, Seoul. She um, has an apartment. So this whole thing was a mistake for her. Like she shouldn't be quarantined um, because she's a resident. So I don't know the story behind that, but because she wasn't prepared for quarantine, um, she didn't pack any food for her, her baby. So her baby was like exhausted, no diapers, no food. And, um, you know, the whole thing was just kind of uh, a, a huge hot mess. So, um, you know, when it was time for us to off, you know, off board, I wished her luck. You know, she didn't want to leave the bus because she didn't want to basically like uh, implicitly agree to the quarantine by stepping off the bus. So she did not, not want to get off the bus, you know, but I did, you know, with a few other people. And um, so you know, we basically went into a processing room um, within the hotel. You know, it was just one of like the large rooms within a hotel. And um, I noticed that the hotel was kind of gutted. So um, it's the Ramada um, Encore in Gimpo. And um, it does not look like a hotel. It's a hotel from the outside, but from the inside, it's a processing facility. So everything is covered in like, you know, with equipment, you know, a lot of the chairs and stuff were just like pile on top of each other. Um, there's no, there's, there's no hotel employees. I don't, these guys are just government employees, I think. Um, they're here to process people and make sure that um, that they don't have the virus. And if they do have the virus, they're fully prepared to handle that type of situation. But um, essentially there's nothing, like there's no creature comforts in here at all. Like we're stuck in our rooms for two weeks. We're not allowed to step outside of our rooms for two weeks. Okay. So um, as we were being processed, you know, they asked me, you know, what kind of food, you know, that I, I, I wanted. And I said vegetarian because there was no vegan options. Um, <clears throat> and then, I, you know, that's when I asked them about, like, you know, how many people are in here, you know, 300, how many hotels or how many facilities are there or hotels. They said five to six. So that's a lot of people. Um, and then they gave me my room and it's 901. So I feel like I may be on the top floor. Um, so um, that's why I have a nice view and um, that was it I entered and I have some pictures of what my room looked like when I entered um, basically you know I had to make my own sheets there are like I was given like five small little towels there's a white plastic bag with the things that um, you know it's basically like a starter kit I guess so five little towels a lot of like a whole sleeve of paper cups one small, like, it looked like a pack of cigarettes, but it's actually coffee sticks, like instant coffee sticks. 
Um, and what else? Two bottles of water. And I, oh, and some slippers. So that was my starter kit. And, um, and then I just started making myself comfortable. And um, I'm going to stop there because there's just, you know, I can, I'll probably give you guys a tour in the next section.